Live from Austin, Texas, it's theCUBE. Covering KubeCon and CloudNativeCon 2017. Brought to you by Red Hat, the Linux Foundation, and theCUBE's ecosystem partners. Hey, welcome back everyone. Live here in Austin, Texas, theCUBE's exclusive coverage of KubeCon and CloudNativeCon. It's third year, not even third year, I think it's second year, and not even three years old as a community. Growing like crazy, over 4,500 people here. Combined of all the other shows, it's double than it was before. I'm John Furrier, co-founder of SiliconANGLE. It's Stu Miniman, analyst here. Our next guest, Gabe Mon Monroy, who's lead PM, product manager for containers for Microsoft Azure. Gabe, welcome to theCUBE. Thanks, glad to be here, big fan of the show. Great Thank to have you. you on. I mean, obviously container madness, we've got past that. Now it's Kubernetes madness, which really means that the evolution of the industry is really starting to get some clear lines of sight. It's a straight and narrow, if you will, people are starting to see a path towards scale, developer acceleration, more developers coming in than ever before, this cloud native world. Uh, Microsoft's doing pretty well with the cloud right now. Numbers are great. Hiring a bunch of people, give us a quick update. Big news, what's going on? Yeah, so uh, you know, a lot of things going on. You know, I'm just excited to be here. I think, you know, for me, I'm new to Microsoft, right? I came here about seven months ago uh, by way of a deus acquisition, and uh, you know, you know, I like to think of myself as kind of representing you know, the, you know, part of this new Microsoft trend, right? Um, you know, my career was built on open source, right? I started a company called Deus and we were focused on really Kubernetes-based solutions. And um, you know, here at Microsoft, I'm really doing you know, a lot of the same thing, but you know, with you know, Microsoft's cloud as, as sort of the, 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 the vehicle um, you know, that we're, we're trying to you know, attract developers to. What news do you guys have here? Some services? Yeah, so we got a bunch of things we're talking about. So uh, the first is uh, something I'm especially excited about. So this is the virtual kublet. Now, I'll tell a little bit of story here because I think, I think it's actually kind of fascinating. So back in July, we la launched a thing called Azure Container Instances. And what ACI was first of its kind service, containers in the cloud, right? Just run a container, runs in the cloud. It's micro builds and it is uh, invisible infrastructure. So you know, part of the definition of serverless there. Um, as part of that, you know, we want to make it clear that if you're going to do complex things with these containers, you really need an orchestrator. So we released this thing called the ACI connector for Kubernetes along with it. And we were excited to see people just were so drawn to this idea of serverless Kubernetes, right? A Kubernetes that you know, didn't have the VMs associated with it. And uh, uh, folks at Hyper.sh, who have a similar serverless container offering, um, they, they you know, took our code base and, and forked it and did a version of theirs. And, and you know, Brent and I were you know, thinking together and we were like, oh man, there's, there's something here. Like, we, we should explore this. And so um, you know, we, we you know, got some engineers together, we put a lot of work together, and we announced now this, in conjunction with Hyper and others, this virtual kublet that bridges the world of Kubernetes with the world of these new serverless container runtimes like ACI. Okay, yeah. can, can you explain that a little bit? How sure. people, people have been coming in saying, wait, to serverless replace? How does it work? Is Kubernetes underneath, though? So, yeah. yeah, so I think the, the best place to start is the definition of serverless. And I, and I think serverless is really uh, the conflation of three things. It's invisible infrastructure, yeah. it is microbilling, and it is an event-based programming model. It's sort of the classical definition, right? Now what we did with ACI and serverless containers is we took that last one, the event-based programming model, and we said, look, you don't need to do that. If you want to write a container, anything that runs in a container can work, not just functions. Um, and so that is, I think, you know, uh, a really important distinction that um, I, I believe it's really the best of serverless is you know, that micro-billing and invisible infrastructure. Well, that's built in, isn't it? Correct, yeah. What are the biggest challenges of serverless? Because first of all, it's nirvana in the mind of a developer who doesn't want to deal with plumbing. Yes. Meaning networking plumbing, storage, and you know, a lot of the details around configurating, just program away, be creative, spend their time building. Yes. What is the big differences between that? What's the, what are the issues and challenges that serverless has for people adopting it, or is it frictionless at this point? Well, you, you know, as far, I mean, it depends on what you're talking about, right? So I think, you know, for functions, you know, it's very simple to, you know, get a function service, like Azure Functions, and you know, deploy functions and start chaining those together. And um, people are ex uh, seeing rapid, you know, adoption, and, and, and that's progressing nicely. Um, but there's also a, a contingent of folks who, you know, represented, you know, here at the show, who are really interested in containers as the primitive and not functions, right? Um, f containers are inclusive of lots of things, functions being one of them. Um, and 
betting on containers as like the compute artifact is actually a lot more flexible and solves a lot more use cases. So you're know, making sure that we can streamline ease of use for that while also bringing the benefits of serverless. Uh, you know, really the way I think of this is marrying our uh, uh, AKS, our managed Kubernetes service, with ACI, our you know, serverless containers. So you can get to an, a place where you can have a, a Kubernetes uh, environment that has no VMs associated with it like literally zero VMs, you scale the thing down to zero, and when you want to run a, a pod or container, you just pay for a few seconds of, of time, and then you kill it and you, you stop paying for it, right? All right, so talk about customers. Yep. What's the customer experience that you guys are going after? Did you have any beta customers? Who's adopting your approach? Can you highlight some examples of some really cool, and you know the name names if you can't, anecdotal data will be good. Yeah, well, I, you know, I think on the blog post, announcement blog post page, uh, we have a really great video of uh, Siemens uh, Healthineers, I believe is the name. Uh, uh, but basically, a you know, healthcare company that is looking, that, that is using Kubernetes on Azure, AKS specifically, to you know, disrupt the healthcare market and to benefit real people. And you know, to me, I think it's important that we remember that, you know, you know, we're deep in this technology, right? But at the end of the day, this is about helping developers who are in turn helping real world people. And I think that video is a good example. And what was of their that. impact? Speed? Speed of development? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think it's really, main, the main thing is agility, right? People want to move faster, right? And so that's the main uh, benefit that we hear. I think, you know, cost is, is obviously a concern for folks, but I think in, in practice, the people cost of operating, you know, some of these uh, uh, systems is, it tends to be a lot higher than the infrastructure cost, right? When, when you stack them up. So people are willing to pay a little bit of a premium, you know, you, you know to make it easier on people, uh, you know, and we see that over and over again. Yeah, Gabe, why don't you speak to kind of the speed of a company the size of Microsoft Microsoft. So, you know, the Deus acquisition, of course, was already focused on Kubernetes before inside of Microsoft. See, I mean, big cloud companies moving really fast on Kubernetes. I've heard complaints from customers like, I can't get a good roadmap because it's moving so fast. <laughs> You know, I, I would say that was one of the biggest surprises for me joining Microsoft is just how fast things move inside of Azure in particular, right? And I, I, I think it's terrific. You know, I think that there's a really good focus of you know, making sure that we're meeting customers where they are and building solutions that you know, you know, meet the market, but also just executing and delivering and, and, and doing that with, with speed. You know, uh, you know, uh, one of the things that is most interesting to me is like the geographic spread. And Microsoft is in you know, so many different regions, you know, more, more than any other cloud. Compliance you know, certification, we take the, all that stuff really seriously. Um, and being able to do all those things, the, be, be the enterprise friendly cloud, while also moving at this breakneck pace in terms of innovation, um, it's really spectacular to watch from the inside. A lot of people don't know that when they think about Azure, they think, oh, they're copying Amazon, but Microsoft has tons of data centers. They've had browsers, they're all over the world. So it's not like they're foreign to region areas. I mean, they're everywhere. Microsoft is ever, and not only is it not foreign, I mean, you got to remember, Microsoft is an enterprise software company at its core, right? We know developers, that is what we do. Um, and going into cloud in this way is just, it, it's extremely natural for us. Uh, and, and you know, I think that the same can't really be said for everyone who's trying to move into cloud. I mean, we've got history of working with developers, yeah. building platforms, um, uh, you know, we've entire you know, division devoted to developer tooling, right? Okay, so yeah. I want to ask about two things that came up, that comes up a lot. One is very trendy, one is kind of not so trendy but super important. One is AI, because yes. AI with software is going to impact and disrupt storage, and with uh, virtual kubelets, this is going to be to change the storage game, but it's going to enhance the machine learning and AI capability. And the other one is data warehousing, or data analytics. Two very important trends. One is certainly a driver for growth and has a lot of sex appeal, obviously AI and machine learning, but all the analytics being done on cloud, whether it's an IoT device, this is like a nice use case for containers and orchestration. Your comment and reaction to those two trends. Yeah, and you know, I, I think that AI and deep learning generally is something that we see driving a ton of demand for uh, you know, container orchestration. You know, I've worked with lots of customers, including folks like OpenAI, on their Kubernetes infrastructure, um, you know, running on Azure today. Um, you know, uh, something that uh, Elon Musk actually <laughs> proudly uh, mentioned. That was a good moment for, right. for the Azure containers. Get a free Tesla. Uh, uh, yeah, so, <laughs> Broker uh, some Teslas and get that new one <laughs> that goes from zero to 104.5 seconds. Right, yeah. Right, yeah so you so got a good customer in OpenAI. What, what was the impact of them? What was the big well, you know, this is ultimately about empowering people. In this case, they happen to be data scientists, you know, to get their job done and in a way where, I mean, I look at it as, 
you know, we're doing our jobs in the infrastructure space if the infrastructure disappears, right? Like it, the, the, the more conceptual overhead we're bringing to developers, you know, that means we're not doing our job. All right, so question then specifically is, deep learning and AI is enhanced by containers and Kubernetes? Absol absolutely. And, and what order of magnitude? Uh, I, I, uh, I don't know, but in order of magnitude enhancement, I would argue, so right? Just Underlying that, you know, the, the really important piece is we're talking about data here. Yes. Um, and one of the things we've been, you know, kind of trying to tackle for the last couple of years, containers, is you know storage, and that's mm -hmm. carried over to Kubernetes. How's Microsoft involved? You know, what's your, you know, prognosis, uh, prognosis as to where we go with kind of so, cloud native storage? Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a fascinating question, and and I actually. So back in the early days, uh, uh, when I was still contributing to Docker, I was one of the largest external contributors to the Docker project in the earlier in my career. Um, I actually wrote some of the storage stuff, and and so I've been going around since in Docker's inception in 2013, saying don't run databases in containers. It's not because you can't, right? You can, um, but just because you can doesn't mean you should, right? <laughs> and and I think exactly. that you know, as someone who's worked in my career as you know, in, 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 on the operations side you know, things like an SLA mean a lot. And so this leads me to another one of our announcements at the show, which is the open service broker for Azure. Now, what we've done, you know, uh, thanks to the Cloud Foundry Foundation, who basically took the service broker concept and spun it out, um, we now are able to take the world of Kubernetes and bridge it to the world of Azure services, data services being sort of some of the most uh, uh, interesting. Now the demo that I like to show this is WordPress, which by the way, uh, you know, it sounds silly, but WordPress powers tons of the web today, still. Um, WordPress is a PHP application and a MySQL database. Well, if you're going to run WordPress at scale, are you going to want to run, want to run that MySQL in a container? Probably not. You're probably going to want to use something like Azure Database for MySQL, which comes with an SLA, backup restore, DR, ops team by Microsoft to manage the yeah. whole thing, right? So, but then the question is, well, I want to use Kubernetes, right? So how do I do that, right? Well, with the open service broker for Azure, we actually shipped a Helm chart. We can Helm install Azure WordPress, and it will install in Kubernetes the same way you would a container-based system, and behind the scenes, it uses the broker to go spin up a Postgres, uh, sorry, a, 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 a MySQL, MySQL, and dynamically attach it. Now, the coolest thing to me about this, yeah, is the agility. But I think the, one of the underrated features is the security. The developer who does that doesn't ever touch credentials. The passwords are automatically generated and automatically injected into the application, so you get to do things like rotations yeah. without ever touching the app. So we're a publisher, we WordPress, we'd love to help us with scale if we did Azure. Absolutely, I've all, after this is uh, uh, over, yeah. we'll go set it up. I mean, I love WordPress, <laughs> but it breaks down. Well, this is the whole point of where auto-scaling shows a little bit of its capabilities in the world, is that you know, PHP does, we'd like to have more instances, yeah, that would be a use case. Okay, Redshift and Amazon wasn't talked about much at reInvent last week. Um, we don't hear a lot of talk around the data warehouse, which is a super important way to think about collecting data in cloud. And is that going to be a, an enhanced feature? Because uh, people want to do analytics. There's a huge analytics audience out there. They're moving off of Teradata. They're doing, they, you guys have a lot of analytics at Microsoft. They might have moved from Hadoop or Hive or somewhere else. So there's a lot of, analytics workloads that would be prime, or at least potentially prime for a Kubernetes. Yeah, you know, I, th I think that, or is that it, not uh, well, no, 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 I, I think it's interesting. I mean, for us, you know, we look at, I, I personally think using something like the service broker, open service broker API to bridge to something like a data lake or, a, a, you know, some of these other Azure, you know, uh, hosted services is probably the better way of doing that because if you're going to run it on containers, these massive data warehouses, yes, you can do it, but the operational burden is high. It's extremely high. To your point about the database earlier. Yeah, so, you know, same general point there. Now, can you do it? Do we see people doing it? Absolutely, yeah, right? I mean, they um, do things something they shouldn't be doing. That's yeah, IT. Uh, <laughs> uh, of, of course, and, and then back to the deep learning example, yeah. you know, those are typically big, you know, large uh, uh, training models um, that have similar, you know, characteristics. All right, as a newbie inside Azure, not new to the industry and community, yep. uh, share some color. What's it like in there? Obviously, um, a number two to Amazon, you guys have great geography presence. You're adding more and more services every day at Azure. Uh, what's the vibe, what's the mojo like over there? Share some inside baseball. Yeah, I, I, I got to say it's a really, I'm not just saying, it's a really exciting place to work. It, things are moving so fast, we're growing so fast. You know, customers really want what we're building. And, uh, you know, I, 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 honestly, day to day, I'm not spending a lot of time looking out, I'm spending a lot of time dealing with enterprises who want to use, you know, use our cloud products. And what and are the top things that you have on your PM list? 
that are, that are top stack ranked features people want? I think you know, a lot of this comes down, you know, uh, in general, I think this whole space is approaching you know, uh, a, a level of enterprise friendliness and enterprise hardening where we want to start you know, adding governance and adding security and adding role-based access controls yeah. across the board um, and, and really making this palatable to high trust environments. Yeah. So I think a lot, that's a lot of our focus. You know, Stability, ease of use. Stability, ease of use are always there. I think the enterprise hardening and you know, things like you know, VNet support for all of our services, VNet service endpoints, those are some things that are high, high on the list. Gabe Monroy, lead product manager for containers at Microsoft Azure Cloud. Great to have you on. Love to talk more about you know, geographies and moving apps around the network and multi-cloud, but another time. Thanks another for coming time. on. Yeah. This is theCUBE live coverage. I'm John Furrier, the co-founder of SiliconANGLE Media with Stu Miniman, Luke Bond. Back with more live coverage after this short break. <laughs>